Hey guys, can you hear us okay? Thank you so much for coming. This is going to be a bit self-moderated. Um, so there's the three of us with different kind of work. Well, I guess Alana and I will be sharing some narrative stuff and then Diana some experimental work of her own, which you also directed? Yeah. Okay, so there will be kind of an interesting mix of work and then the plan is to talk, I guess like address different themes with e each of, I guess like ways of achieving certain shots or certain scenes. And I'll just start by introducing myself, if that's okay. Like, the plan is to say a few words about who we are, our work, introduce the film a little bit, and also open it up to you guys to ask questions in between showing clips so it doesn't get too boring. So, to begin with, hello, I'm Simona. I'm a cinematographer and I work in film mainly. I really love narrative. And sometimes do documentary work when I can and I have the stamina. Um, and also do a mix of commercials, art film. I really love working in that kind of non-plot driven, more like moving image kind of world. And I try to also incorporate that a little bit in my narrative world if the subject allows it. And what I wanna talk about today is how I think about rhythm and pacing and synchronization with the actors when I'm approaching a narrative film. If, this, you know, if the story allows me for more developing shots, slower kind of approach to how the camera moves or how the camera is static. And I'm gonna show something like three, four minutes from a short film called Blood Rites, which was a big step for me because I don't like horror movies at all. So this was my first horror movie, but it was somehow subtle, subtle and not. There's some really gory stuff, which is not in the first three, four minutes but it was also psychological and I guess kind of open to interpretation on how we want to approach it and we gave it a bit of a surreal, it's this weird mix of kind of surreal and real drama and the girls are, I guess like characters based on a play and the script has been written based on a play but hugely adapted so it works for, I guess like cinema. So we're just gonna show it to you and I'll talk about the themes that I kind of prepared in my head. <laughs> so also welcome for questions, please, please. I hope you enjoyed. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so the reason I chose this, well, this section of the film, which is the intro, is to talk about something that I'm quite obsessed with, which is rhythm and how I 
sort of like build the beats of my camera work. And that's also based on the story and what the narrative requires. But I think because of my influence and where I'm coming from, which is Eastern Europe, Romania, all my body of work has been in, you know, kind of influenced uh, by directors like Tarkovsky or like Polish directors like Kishlovsky that um, use this kind of developing nature of shots and allow actors and the viewers time to embrace the story, get sort of like, I don't know, um, engage with the story and have this time of like breathing and kind of inheriting the world if you want. And I really enjoyed that, particularly because I'm an avid, you know, like I love photography and I was doing photography and film from an early age. And for me, photography was my first step towards telling stories in a, in a visual way. But then when you take a photograph and you're capturing either a moment or a person, it's only one image that is supposed to give you something, either an emotion or a message or something that tells you I don't know, like something about a place or captures architecture, whatever it is, it is really just one image. And from there, I feel like it's also the imagination of the viewers to look at that image and to reflect their own, I don't know, interests, things that you know are triggered by that image and sort of like charge that image with their own understanding. And I really love that about cinema. And what I love about the big screen is that it also is a spectacle and when you when you marry that with impressive performances and music and a certain sound design, it can become very immersive. And that's why I connect my work as much as I can. If the story and also the director allows it to some moving image work, which is more like how an artist would approach telling a story that it's based on a character or emotion rather than a plot. So that's very much at the base of my work. And even though it's not you know, the script doesn't allow me to do that per se. I'm still rooting my influence in that. And I'm basing all my references mostly on photography rather than film work at the stage. And I think that's similar probably with Diana because she's doing a lot of her work as a director, cinematographer, also like just capturing herself. And so much about that for me is about reflection and getting into this kind of synchronized rhythm with the audience. And I fear that sometimes when you watch commercial television or you know, films made nowadays, there's no time or respite for an audience to actually take in what they're watching. And there's a natural rhythm that us as humans sort of like live by. Um, generally, even if I'm not, you know, like making a decision about music in a film, which is really not my place, I use music in pre-production to kind of immerse myself into a certain rhythm or build a story world based on music that I like and I find fitting for a project. And I may, you know, even if it's just one song or a certain band or certain melody or like an instrument, that really helps me translate that through my imagery. And this was, that was like true for a documentary that I made with the same director called Audrey. We had temp music that was given by us, uh, to us by the composer months before and all the choreography for the dance that we used in the film. For me, it was based on that. There was a certain tempo that we wanted to translate and her story needed that slowness. And same with this. I mean, you listen to the music and it's kind of creepy and you don't really know what it is and it feels kind of like a real drama, but at the same time, it feels out of this world. And the whole point with the cinematography and the camera work is to really kind of draw you in and give you time to observe who these characters are, you know, look at their individuality, how they're dressed, how they behave, you know, how they sort of take control of the situation. And I guess you have to see the film to understand but that I, I found that kind of slow developing shots would make the story work in that sense. Um, but also from a practical you know, point of view, we had something like four days to shoot this film. I think in the end, it's probably like 15, 16 minutes. But what we filmed was like for 20 minutes, like 20 edited minutes. So that was, a, that was a long script that, you know, we had a limited time and money to make. It was a short film production with really talented people but also shot during the middle of the year, last year, when there was a shortage of crew. So you have to really do what you can to maximize your resources and kind of use your talent and imagination. And I find that, I, I find that limitation fascinating. And as long as you incorporate that into the language of your film, and it's a grammar that you're embracing as a team, and that means director, producer, cinematographer, and also your camera team, because they have to understand and get in sync with you, I feel like that's a very successful way of telling a story that doesn't get 
you know, it doesn't become like a Frankenstein because you've lost shots because you don't have the right time to approach a scene how you imagined it, but rather like take, char take charge of what the story is and tell it within the time that you had. And I felt like, you know, it was a bit of a lucky thing that the story also worked for the time we had to tell it. It was like four days and that's the end of it and there was no pickup. Well, we did a pickup in the director's uh, kitchen. But, you know, that was an exception. That was a funding that we needed for the edit. But, yeah, the idea is to create a world for, you know, for the script that also embraces the time constraints and the budget constraints. And I really love that kind of approach of being economical, creating a rhythm, and really using also your actors to support you in that. Because you've seen there are some moments in that shot when they go inside the house that is not quite perfect for my taste. We did have takes where right at the end when the camera arrives and you see the hallway again, the girl coming from the living room on the left side, actually she just arrives when the camera lands in the middle. So that was a lot of work of giving notes to the actors and them you know, going back to their performance and sort of like basing that on the rhythm of their own. And it's kind of magical how it was me, the director, there was three actors, there was my grip that had to you know, kind of find that tempo and it was just beautiful, you know, kind of beautiful synergy be between all the people that actually make this work because it's not just me as a DP, I do have a vision, but if there's nobody in the team that can push that dolly and find that perfect way of, you know, creating that mood, then it's not going to work. Um, so yeah, I really like that in a more kind of like, I don't know, if you look at the, from a bird's eye view way, a team kind of works as an orchestra and, you know, like they come together to create something. Or not, Diana <laughs> does things on her own. Um, but yeah, that's, that's more of a, I guess, um, theoretical like, way of looking at things. But yeah, from a practical point of view, you have to get everybody on board to kind of create that feeling and that rhythm between people off camera and on camera. And there's always like a counter, like a metronome going in my head when I'm shooting, when I'm operating, even if it's just dialogue scenes of like one, two, three, four. I also study drumming at, at the moment. So for me, everything is just based on a rhythm. It's like even walking on the street has a rhythm. The movement of the cars, whatever, everything has a rhythm. So I try to incorporate that as much as possible in the work. And that's what I wanted to address. <laughs> if you have any questions, please raise your hand. There's I actually have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Because I'm, I find very interesting um, this relationship with music because it's actually the department or the medium that is farther away from our world. We always talk about things that are very tangible light and framing at a whole different universe, but it has a lot to do as well with what we do. And um, like, how do you select the music that you're listening while you're prepping or that gets you into a certain mood for that film? Is that something that comes because of the directors you work with or is something that comes because of you? Like you propose them something or? I don't no, know. I think it you know, depends on the director and my relationship with them, but I usually keep that music for myself, at least up to a point. And that's something that it might just come into my mind when I'm reading a script this first or the second time, or when I'm doing my notes in terms of what would work from my point of view is how do we actually break this scene? You know, maybe sometimes you get you know, a script and you're like, am I interested in this? Can I actually make it work? Can I project anything on this uh, film? And before even actually starting a conversation with the director, I'm trying to create my own vision of what would work for the story. And at some point, I do bring that up to a director, but rarely. And I, I just don't like imposing things, but rather listening. But there are some times which I find fascinating. There's directors that have their own playlist that they show me. Yeah. And that's really funny because you're like, okay. And then you're like, oh, it's... Uh, music that I really love and I did a short film with another young director for BBC and then his playlist was like Nine Inch Nails. So when I got that I'm like I know that I actually have like a common you know like a common vision with this person or at least I can reference things that they would understand because there's a certain mood or feeling that comes from music like that. So yeah and it's music that I've listened in the past it's not something that I'm actively looking for it's just something that I've referenced that's why like you have to take time to find these resources, whatever they are, like music or visual images that kind of enrich your world to actually have something to say at some point. Not always possible, but yeah. So we're still kind of open for questions if there's somebody around. Thank you. Wait. Is this is on? Okay. Um, I've got a couple of technical questions. Go ahead. Um, 
what in the car scene, so you were like zooming in, you said you used a dolly, but then it went really fast as the the car door shut. What yeah. sort of um, rig were you using or like how did, did how did you, how did you make that happen? So that was that's not perfectly achieved in a sense because the person that was doing the dolly was actually my spark. So we were like, okay, we're really trying to make this work. It was camera on a zoom. It was like 10 to 1 zoom, 25 to 250. And I had the set focal length that I was starting the shot with. And I was zooming in while I was tracking in and also jibbing up. So there was a lot going on. And the shot was, even though there's actually a cut interrupting the scene of that, you know, there's a POV of a man with a dog. That was shot as a whole scene because we wanted to keep that tempo throughout. And when I'm moving from the girl with the curly hair to Miran, who says, Shh, that's a, just a whip pan. So that's just, you know, a classic, classic pan. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got another question too, if that's yeah. cool. In the editing process, because you're talking about you have the vision and you have your tempo, do you work closely with, um, do you edit or do you work with the director and the editor? Like, how does that work for you in post production? Mm, don't, I'm not part of the edit. Sometimes the film would be sent to me and I can give notes if the director wants that. Less and less now because the rhythm is just so fast. But in the first five years of being a DP, I edited. And I edited my own material that I also directed. And that was, for me, actually, the best single thing to do as a cinematographer to understand film grammar and understand how shots work and understanding that rhythm and knowing what works instinctually. Because if a cut is too, you know, too fast or too slow, that I think that interrupts a viewer's experience. So for me, that was essential to actually understand how cinematography works. It was through editing. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can shoot on your iPhone and edit a story. Yeah, thank you. If you guys don't have any questions now, I think we're still going to do maybe like something at the end. But like I can pass on the mic to Alana. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alana Mejia Gonzalez. I'm a cinematographer. And as well, I work a bit in very different mediums. I'd say fiction is probably what's taken the majority of my time in the last couple of years, but I also do commercials and music videos, and I work with artists um, as well. I've done uh, different pieces for more of the visual arts um, world. And what I think I'm mainly driven is the story. Like, um, if the project feels like I connect with some aspects of the project. I don't really mind the format or the medium or the length or the shape. So um, I wanted to share with you today a, a scene from a, from a short film, a very dear short film, one of my, I mean, I, I maybe I keep saying one of my first ones, but probably it was not one of my first ones, but I felt like it was a big gap in, uh, in the way that, not only the connection with the director, but in, in the way that I uh, had learned cinematography and approached cinematography. Um, the film is called Forastera, and it's directed by Lucia Lenyer. It premiered in the Semana de la Critique in Cannes 2020, which uh, didn't happen in person. And yeah, just uh, I'll, I'll share it with you, and we can discuss a bit more about it later.
Um, well, this is um, this is um, a scene uh, the, in the, really in the middle of the of the short. Um, it's a short film about a character who's a 15 year old that has been sent to spend the summer with uh, at her grandparents' house after the the death of her grandmother, and she starts um, realizing that she has. Uh, a power with her family because she really resembles like her dead grandmother and especially for her grandfather who is appears at the end of the of the um, uh, scene like uh, the, the idea is that this girl is suddenly becoming an adult by embracing what the grandmother is not anymore and that she starts to have an, an, an a, she holds the power of attracting men and her grandfather in a way that during the short film you don't really, um, it doesn't really explain what really happens more than so a teenager that is in, a, in this uh, crucial summer of her life where the relationship with her family and mainly with herself and who she is for that um, ecosystem that a family is, is shifting um, massively. So this was a project that was developed through um, a lot of long talks. The director and I didn't live in the same country and hadn't spent uh, a lot of time in that in that uh, um, in the house in, in the months we prepared before. Um, but it was a very uh, it was a very close collaboration because we we mainly watch a lot of films together. I mean, I kept thinking like, what should I talk about um, in this in this talk and. How did I get that shot? And I mean, there's a part that is technical, but there's also a part that I think it comes from a, uh, a different place that has to do with, um, as a DP, how I get to understand what the director wants to say with this project. And um, the story is, is basically based on uh, the, the director's family uh, story, herself in relationship with her family. We shot in her grandparents' house. So there's a lot of value in the, in the, in the intimate connection that the, re the director has with the space. Um, and I think it was, it was a, a moment in which she came with a lot of ideas about how she wanted to very subtly understand or like observe a character that is dealing with um, internal changes that she doesn't really know yet how to express. And she's playing, she's also playing in this odd uh, costume of her grandmother and then going through the grandmother uh, objects by be and becoming someone else by embracing the persona of, uh, of, um, of a family member who's not there anymore. And also comp coping with griefing of the recent lost. So we, we watched a lot of films. We had us a, uh, one of the main references was uh, Holly Girl by Lucrecia Martel. We also watched um, a lot of uh, um, uh, scenes that were uh, um, um, Call Me By Your Name and the way that the camera follows a character but also gets lost in space and then continues uh, exploring how a character is discovering uh, the place that they're embracing. For me, that was um, uh, a challenge because the house is very small. We also watched a film together that we both fell in love with uh, called uh, Ridges, a song. It's a small film by a uh, Danish uh, visual artist, which is all shot in magic hour in the uh, summer, midsummer in uh, Sweden. And then there's a lot of dolly shots, developing shots. There are sequence shots in which there's a lot of um, characters that uh, enter and leave and then they go through a space and there's like probably six, seven minutes um, developing shots that were a massive inspiration to translate the ideas of being with a character and also having a, um, a camera that moves in a space almost as if it was the ghost of the grandmother that is no longer there. So this, we, we watched a lot of things that were not necessarily also uh, part of the film world. We watched inspiration come from photography, also like uh, Alexandra Sanguinetti's uh, work in, in South Argentina of this magical realism of girls that turn domestic space into into uh, their universe that is not there, but is there. And the, the film was a lot about um, sense of loss and also sense of uh, empowerment through embodying someone else and then realizing the, the, the beauty and the danger of that power that you gain as a teenager. Um, 
And then I was looking at the notes this morning. I, that this film was shot in 2018 or early 2018, and uh, I was just looking at the at the notes and then thinking that we almost for every scene we had a, a photography. Like it was it was uh, either a, a photography project by people we liked or it was like a still image that we had found somewhere and I. Looking back at the film this morning, I realized that we had achieved a lot of, like, I can see where this inspiration came from, and there's like, it's sometimes like a sketch um, that I, I have started realizing it happens in my work a lot, where like there's an image that suddenly there is something, whether it's a color difference, or there's a framing, or there is a, you know, the look of someone in the back of the picture that inspires what a scene is about, and I, the way I work is like, I, I'm very bad at remembering the names of the scenes and then they change and then, so I, I always try to put a visual to that scene which tries to sum up what the director has told me that is important from that scene. And then eventually it changes but there's something that re remains from that or original talks of what was the, the important thing of each of the um, scenes that will, that will make a bigger piece of work. Um, and then I uh, also work a lot with, uh, I mean, non-natural light because this is also one of the things that I got, I, I got a lot of calls to shoot projects after people had seen this uh, short saying, oh, it's great, I would like you to work with natural light. And I was like, good, but we didn't, it was not natural light in the project. Or like, it was, it was not necessarily having a lot of equipment and, or like a lot of like cables and stands, but we did have a lot of staff. We work a lot with textiles in this project. It was uh, probably the, the first time I was trying um, that kind of approach in a bigger scale. So the house is white and inside, outside, the neighbor's house and everything around is white. Um, as a lot of houses in, in Mallorca. This, this one was shot in, in Mallorca. And, uh, and we could do certain things within the space, but also the house was small. Um, a lot of the rooms were like having this odd shape. It's an old summer house. And I work a lot with lots of negative textiles to be able to shape up the space, as well as uh, with a lot of uh, positive bounds from outside. So from like hanging big, big pieces of cloth from the neighbor's house because the way the sign was gonna move, it was gonna create a big bounce into the space where we needed need it. And um, that was something that I think it helped me, it, it uh, taught me a lot to work in a way with natural light, but at the same time, not really, because you're just shaping how the architecture of your location, but also the locations around or the space around, um, makes you build a scene. Um, and I don't know if you guys have some questions. I don't know if can, uh, there's uh, some aspects that you might be more interested in. Of course. Or we can go directly to Diana. Hi, sorry, it's quite a quick question, I guess. Just like how, like, was, did you rehearse? Because it's all one shot, if I remember correctly. Did you rehearse with the actress before? Or did you kind of go with how you, you saw the camera going and she did her own thing and you just kind of followed. Um, yeah, what was the process there? Um, I mean, yeah, there was more than a, a specific rehearsal. There was a lot of uh, conversations of where we place the objects that she can interact with in the scene. And then we understand where we are with the camera because there was no handheld, it was a tripod. We couldn't get the dolly up here. The, the door was very small and couldn't lift it through the terrace. This is on the first floor. So it was a lot of like, where do we place the objects with the production designer and the director? So the actor, in a way, has the capacity of exploring freely the room, bearing in mind that there's a, it was almost a two meter slider in a room that is quite tiny, and we had to lift all the you know, tables and, and beds, and then you just have to pretend that there's a whole table or a whole bed, and just a corner of it. Um, so I think more than rehearsing, it was understanding how the space can work for both of us, that I can move freely, because also, I mean, actually, I'm looking at it this morning and now, the shot that got uh, edited is the one I was the less happy with because there's a moment when I'm operating, <laughs> um, I miss her. I miss the veil for a second. And then I was like, we, I don't know, we did maybe five, six takes, and then that was the only one I missed it. And then I realized that when, it, when they edited it, it was like, oh, okay, 
but maybe it was more special. There was, there's something that you're missing, and then suddenly you discover something after you're not expecting. You almost think that the shot is over there, and then it keeps going. So then I also understood that from those mistakes, there's a lot of uh, truth that comes up that sometimes is what makes the story. So it was rehearsed and, not, and a bit not. It was more like placing the geography of the space in the right. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello, do you hear me? Yeah, um, I'm Diana Olivierova and um, I'm a cinematographer and I work a lot in narrative, uh, TV, film and commercials, music videos as well. I like everything. Um, I shot We Are Lady Parts in Channel 4 and Heartstopper that just came out on Netflix. And um, this film that I'm going to show is my self-portrait. Um, I find it really important to explore other things apart from, you know, um, just straightforward filmmaking. For me, it's important to like get into the depths of the visual language and in general just explore the world. So I always come up with little ideas that I film sometimes with myself, sometimes with other people. So I've done like maybe 15 short films by myself. And uh, it's for me, it's just part of playing with the camera and the visual language. And this is one of the examples that I've just done this year. Um, if I can ask to turn off the light before it starts because it's really fast paced. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's a um, very important project for me because I shot it where I'm from, um, in Ukraine, um, beginning of this year. So.
Um, yeah, so um, it originally started from Lumix um, giving me uh, kind of open, you know, open um, opportunity to do a film. So I worked with them two years ago and a pandemic, they uh, released the camera called um, S1H and they asked um, a couple of filmmakers to make films. So I did that two years ago, a film called Quadrality, where I also am featured in it, because it was kind of like, who do you shoot when you're like on your, on your own in your room? <laughs> so I did that, and it was really nice and interesting, and they, you know, we joined working together. So this time it was um, the new camera called um, GH6, and they sat down, do you want to do another film? You know, can give you a budget and the camera. So, you know, I started from, it was December, and I was thinking about what do I want to feel like do film about, because I feel like it kind of, comes to me, like eventually I kind of like fill myself up with lots of experiences and then I come up with something and then again I go, you know, empty and I fill myself up with experience and I come out with something. So every year I would do a film or something. Um, so that was the time when I felt like I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do something. And I was really thinking about what, what do I feel like doing because, yeah, the idea of going back home to Ukraine was... Um, was important for me because I felt like I want to come back to my past and actually see my journey through, you know, the last 10 years when I've been in the UK and kind of combining, you know, my past and my influences and everything there to, you know, to my uh, life in London now. And, you know, I had lots of um, ideas about using circles and coming back through the circles, coming from beginning to the end, back to the beginning and kind of exploring the identity and change and uh, where you come from and where you're going. And, you know, there's a lot of very philosophical stuff that I kind of like writing down as a brainstorm and it was just words and some images I had to send them as a treatment. So kind of like a visual po poetic treatment was just a couple of words, a couple of images and that's it. And, you know, they accepted it because I think they, I like that they kind of like quite bold. I think they trust you if they believe in you. So that was really great to just be approved and go with this kind of very abstract metaphorical ideas. And um, I feel like um, in the beginning of the last year, I was a bit more involved with the body and um, different practices like yoga and dance. And I remembered back in Ukraine, I have a really good choreographer friend, um, Anatoly Sachivko, which I admire because he's so talented. And he does this free movement um, workshops. So I went to his workshop and asked him if he wanted to be with, um, with me on this film and help me to make this you know, um, so we did the workshop, it was just middle of February. Um, there was a lot of Ukrainian dancers there in the room, it was like 20 of them, and I was part of, the, of that. And I felt like I really took some of their movement at that time, and I really felt the tension in the air, and it was just very surreal, the feeling of being there. Um, so we filmed it, and then the week after the war started, and it was just really strange having to edit the film when that was all happening. And um, I felt like the edit became much more you know, fast pace, and I, we changed, we made the music as well for the film, so we, we added more like bomb sounds and um, like marches and other things, and I, there was a lot of influence from, you know, Ukrainian music in that as well, so it was just very, like, like a big process. I felt like the film changed from what it was to what it became, but I also like that because I feel like you should do what feels right in the moment with this kind of projects and kind of capture the time, you know. And in terms of like um, techniques of making it, it's been like we spent, I spent like 14 days making this film. It was sporadic days throughout like two months. And in Ukraine, I was quite, um, I shot a lot during three days. But then in London, I did some pickups here and there. We did this, we built the door and there were a couple of people that helped me on set with the door um, in studio. And so I had the team for that. Um, we had, uh, you know, lighting people, uh, camera people, and I was in shot and behind the camera, kind of running around. So, and, but other shots um, in when I'm by myself in a house, that was all just me with the camera by myself. And I find that quite meditative to like do the shot, come back, look at it again, do it again, come back again, and kind of just do it over and over until you feel like you get something. And then in the edit was also very interesting to like. I selected my shots that I liked, that I thought were the best. So it was about seven hours of material and I selected 25 minutes and then the editor managed to make it four. And um, it was really useful to sit with the editor and it's a lot about pacing and the movement and how the one shot transitions into another. So yeah, there were a lot of play with the shapes and the compositions there and lighting um, and openings and closings and you know, uh, being in transition in fronts.
If any questions, please feel free. Oh. Um, we have time for one question. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is might be a bit of a personal question, but I'm curious what words you used um, for the treatment. Um, I did this workshop, uh, movement workshop, before uh, the film actually, and. Um, we were doing movements and they said, come up with a phrase that represents um, your dance and what is in your head right now. And uh, my phrase was moving slowly, uh, moving slowly, oh. moving slowly in circle within fast world, something like that. And that was one of the, you know, one of the kind of poetic words that I put down there. And there was a lot about uh, transitioning, um, about coming from beginning to the end, and from the end to the beginning, um, about um, exploration. I have like the whole page of my diary just written lots of different words, so kind of like, that makes sense to anyone, but yeah, it was about um, being uh, submerged in the space and disappearing in it, and also feeling it out, feeling the spaces, things like that. Um, it was a lot about met metaphorical like movement of the legs and the water in it, and um, hiding inside the water, so things like that. I would just write them down and see people like that, but you know. <laughs> I think it's it's interesting to play with words and what they represent, because they're so literal. So sometimes you just want to break them out of the context of those sentences and just put them a bit chaotically, and I think that would describe that more than just nicely written text, you know. That's how I write my scripts, it's just like selections of words and like a bit of a break, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more if anyone has another question. Yeah? Okay. Hi, that was a very beautifully intimate thank film, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, my question is kind of more so to do with the lighting. I feel like there was very much an importance in the lighting throughout the whole short film. Like you have that switch between the natural to that more controlled studio lighting, and there's a lot of switch in color so I guess I kind of wanted to know if there was a meaning behind the use of the color and the lighting in your film and whether, yeah, if there's a meaning behind that or whether it was kind of used to frame your movements and just kind of frame the rest of the scene in the film. Thank you. Um, I guess in the original treatment I had like black and white and red as the main topic, so it was just all black um, with white text on it and dark images and some red throughout. And I kind of um, felt like that was the best um, approach for this, kind of like quite minimalistic red and white and black. But of course, there's, in the world, there's so many other colors, and you know, um, in the bathroom, there is like blue as well. And I kind of spread it into like four different um, things, like water, fire, um, earth, and air, like kind of obvious, but yeah. <laughs> and um, so for the fire and the stuff, I used red, and then the water was blue, and then uh, the air was white, um, and the earth was more dark uh, and kind of slightly desaturated. So I kind of played with all these things. But um, sometimes when I'm, uh, well, with the color use in general, I just usually feel like, you know, I had this LED lights that I can just turn on and off and change the color by how I wanted it. So often I would just play around and see what looks best, and uh, I feel like that's the best approach for this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, the red was really important for me, so I've used that a lot in that. Thank you. Just, this is one for all three of you. I'm curious about, do you feel a lot of pressure in the moment to be able to come up with all the answers and you're in a tight space and you've got light and you've got I just wonder what that's like having to have all these things just at your fingertips and how much you feel the pressure on you to make something work and what that's like electric <laughs> <laughs> literally <laughs> no I feel like um, I love pressure because it's like makes me more excited and like you kind of on adrenaline and you come up with ideas because you um, have limitations in time and uh, you know in space and it always makes you more creative and you just you know just tr keep trying to find solutions so it's very exciting yeah and of course it's always about balancing time and opportunity yeah mm. 
Yeah, I, um, I think as much as I regret part of this, I think I work well under pressure. <laughs> and um, this year I worked with a director that uh, taught me something very valuable. He used to say, I don't want more options. More options make me more confused. Because I spent years writing scripts for my future and then I know what I need. Um, so I don't necessarily want to cover myself more. I don't want more takes. I want to just make sure that what I need, I got it. And there is something in the limits of the day. I love that the, there's, I mean, and the days in which you are shooting daytime and then you end by the end of daylight is great because suddenly it's like, okay, we can have, if we've done our, well, our job well up to now, we kind of need to know what we are aiming at getting in the day and then, you know, Daylight is running, so we have to make decisions. Like, there's a time where we cannot keep opening options and options, which I think is a very contemporary trend. It's like, you know, look for more, more, more. And I don't think that necessarily that gets you to a better place. So uh, there is something with the pressure, of like, okay, this is it. Like, we have today to make this scene happen. That, at least to me, helps me concentrate. It's not like, oh, maybe if I had seen that other film reference, or if I had thought about this other light uh, solution, or the other frame is like, okay, now here, Let's, let's just try to, let's, let's aim at the best that we can where we are. I have a more kind of philosophical approach to things, which is when you choose work, you should choose work that you believe in and you feel like you can add something to it. And I think that gives you the resource to come up with ideas and solutions in the moment. And in a way, although there's time and money pressure and whatever, you know, like, you know, we're gonna lose daylight. That feels really good because you come up with solutions that you wouldn't sitting at a desk. That never works for me, but also it's just from knowing yourself and I don't know, finding, you know, a style that works for you or like something that drives you. Like Diana does her personal projects and I'm sure that's like part of her inspiration for her narrative work. And everybody has, you know, their own hobbies and interests that kind of serve building up that sort of vision. And then, you know, like if you do find yourself in the right moment, in the right place, and with the right people, which I think is really important, there's a crazy synergy that gives you the right thing at the right time. And I think it's not just about me, I think it's about the whole team that I'm leading on my end of things. And then if you're smart enough, listen to the people around you that might actually give you better solutions than you can think, of, think about. So it's just about being open and kind of charging yourself with the right, I don't know, inspiration over time and allowing yourself that time because it doesn't happen in a year or two. Just find things that, I don't know, nourish you. But I think the pressure is also fun. You know, it's part of it. <laughs> is this it? I think we have to wrap up now. I've tried to push it as much as I could because we could just listen to your amazing stories and watch your beautiful work all day long. Um, but guys, please give a big hand to these three amazing women. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and yeah, stick around in like 15 minutes. There'll be an open mic pitch, which will be really exciting. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much again. Thank you.